<laughs> what do ducks wear to dances? What do ducks wear to dances? Duxedos, nicely done. Wow, that was impressive. I'm actually super impressed with that. Uh, what kind of fruit has the most electricity in it? What kind of fruit has the most electricity in it? A watermelon. <laughs> All right, so um, we were watching a movie as a family this weekend, and I thought of you guys. So we're going to watch a little trailer. Um, all of it? No, I'm just gonna, we're going to watch the whole trailer, but it's like 31 seconds. Should I pause it like in 15? Or? I mean, that's long. Oh, it's like... cartoon representation of how the brain works. And so there's memories that are floating around, right? At some point I shouted out in the middle of the media room, hippocampus, we're in the hippocampus. All the kids look at me like, Dad, there's no hippopotamuses <laughs> in this movie at all. <laughs> Not sure what you're watching, Dad, but we're watching this. But that's when I thought of you guys. I was like, oh, this is totally relevant. You guys should watch this movie. You should totally watch this movie. Okay? So, Inside Out, it's pretty cute. Uh, the little red guy is my favorite. There's a little, what's the little red emotion? Anger, right? He like, hair goes on fire, and he gets ready to, you know, just blast somebody, and he like grabs the joysticks, it's like full throttle, and he like screams, or the person screams, right? It's great. Did you have a comment, Matthew? I had a question. Which emotion is it that you're going to be harnessing? Curiosity. Ooh, curiosity. Okay. Um, so for hyperselfie. For what? Hyper Hydrocephalus? Hydro Are you going to like get into real content? <laughs> <laughs> I was having fun and you're just like... <laughs> <laughs> I can go back to that. No, no, that's totally... We should probably do real work, so, yes. Um, can that develop later? Can Hydrocephalus develop later in life? It can. It's a little more unusual. Um, if it does develop, a lot of times it's associated with like a brain tumor. And so there'll be a mass or an adenoma, a lesion that um, will grow and cause blockage of the cerebral spinal cord. Yeah. That's a real good question, but way less fun than what we were talking about. All right, so I'm in a good mood today. Yeah, I know. So my kids gave me this to show you. They like science jokes, they like making fun of their dad, because they think I'm a total nerd. But I really think that's fun. And I, I have a few friends. I mean, I'm pretty sure. Um, and most of my friends wouldn't laugh at this, actually. Or they'd laugh at me because I get much more funny. Does anybody need it to be explained to them? All right. Okay. All right. We're going to buckle down now. Yeah, you guys should really. I was outside this morning. I think it's therapeutic, so. You better get outside, because we're going to get rain and snow, I think, so. Yeah. Rumor has it, the upper bowl is skiable. I haven't done it, but I've heard folks that claim that it's skiable already. 
Yeah? I think it's awesome. I think that's dope. You're dope, man. <laughs> dope in that. <laughs> All right. You guys ready? Let's do something else. All right. Well, this is actually super relevant because I'm in a good mood and we're going to talk about the limbic system. Okay? So the limbic system controls emotions. That's actually why I thought of uh, the Inside Out flick. It, it's actually a pretty good movie. I really think, um, and I've said it like seven times, you think that like I have an endorsement for it or something. But, uh, I'm not one of the characters. I have no opinion with Pixar or whoever put it on. I just think it's kind of clever. But it just goes to show you that this fascination of the brain is continuing, right? We're still making movies on these plots of what the brain does, right? Uh, so one area that's actually super puzzling is this area known as the limbic system, right? I mean, what puts us in a good mood? I mean, I, I had a great mountain bike ride this morning, and I was probably out in the sun, and so that helps your mood, right? And I wasn't in an office or a lab, and so that helps your mood. And, um, you know, you get exercise, and your blood gets pumping, and I'm out in nature, and it looks great. So probably my limbic system this morning was... Uh, having a lot of stimulation. Um, and, you know, if, if you were in lecture, I'm so sorry about that, that your limbic system may be not uh, going through what mine was this morning. But there's other things that you look forward to. When you have those pleasurable experiences and emotion that's uh, either favorable or not favorable, uh, the limbic system is responsible for, for that. So this is a set of brain structures. It's not one structure. That's why we call the system. And the brain structures that are involved in the limbic system, the ones that we're going to focus on, are listed here. The cingulate gyrus, not the hippopotamus, but the hippocampus, okay? My six-year-old thinks that I'm super dumb, like that. Right? I think I want to Right? I think I even got like a... The amygdala. So the cingulate gyrus is mostly responsible for the following, emotion and the formation of those emotional responses. And you can see the structure known as the cingulate gyrus is this structure right here. Uh, number two, it's involved in um, the processing of learning as well as memory. It has a role in um, executing function of those emotions Right? If you're feeling happy and then you decide to you know, tell somebody that you're happy, right? or you're feeling <laughs> sad and you decide to express to somebody that you're having a crappy day. Um, the hippocampus, this is a structure that is the structure that's responsible for consolidating short-term memory into long-term memory. So, for example... Um, it used to be your, your home phone number, but now nobody has home phones. So your, uh, the address, your street address of the house that you grew up in, or if you moved around a lot, maybe the one that you stayed in the longest, right? So that street address is in long-term memory. Um, your, um, you know, the, the mobile phone number of a close friend uh, from last semester, if you don't remember it, that was in short-term memory. And now it's no longer there. Or someone says, you know, here's my number, they don't text it to you, they just actually say the number to you. That's short-term memory. And if you don't remember it, I mean, nowadays we don't have to remember these numbers because they just come to our devices. Okay? Um, remembering what you paid for gasoline at the pump is going to be a short-term memory because you probably don't remember now unless you bought gas before you came to class. But if you bought it yesterday, the day before, it may no longer be there because it's short-term memory. So the hippocampus is responsible for taking the information that you learn and putting it into long-term memory. Now, another way to look at this is uh, how you study for this class. This is a relevant topic because I'm getting a lot of these questions now that midterm grades are posted. Did you guys see your midterm grades? So a couple of things. Um, Nothing has been dropped from your midterm grade yet. I will drop it at the end of the semester. I will drop your lowest quiz and your lowest worksheet. And the bonus one uh, assignment that you already had is truly bonus. It's out of zero points. Okay? 
Uh, these quizzes this week and the bonus assignment this week are not included in your midterm grades because we haven't done them yet. Okay, and I wanted to get them done a little bit early so you guys could see where things are and make some decisions or come see me. So how you're studying for this class is you're looking at your midterm grade and you're saying, all right, well, I'm cramming right before uh, the exam. Like, you know, Saturday is Halloween and, and then Sunday when I wake up at 4.30 in the afternoon, I'm going to start to study hard for this exam. Okay? Well, that exam is less than 24 hours away by the time you wake up on Sunday morning slash afternoon. So, if you're studying this Sunday only, you're going to be going into um, the exam, uh, and you're going to be focusing on your short-term memory. And if you can't remember what you paid for milk at the grocery store last week, or what you paid for gas, or the price of bread uh, at Safeway two days ago, that strategy of studying the night before is going to be about as effective as recalling your grocery bill. Okay? The way to do it is to put things away into long-term memory. And that's the reason, and I'm actually being somewhat serious about this, um, the way that we organize this class is to try to borderline force you to study well in advance of the exam. And those of you that come to class and hear lecture, you're at a significant advantage than those that don't come because you're being exposed to the material. It's going into short-term memory, and if you're laughing at me, there is an emotional response associated with it, whether you recognize it or not. This is the psychology of Keller's Classroom. The reason I perform such antics and act like a total goofball is to help you guys remember stuff. And if I can actually touch on different emotions and you remember those, or you look at a slide and it causes you to chuckle, you watch the movie and it reminds you of different segments within the brain that we've been talking about, you're making emotional connections and it's going to help your long-term memory in a significant way. So the hippocampus right here is responsible for moving that stuff into long-term memory. The, um, the limbic system uh, is a word uh, in the Latin, uh, limbus. And the limbus is a word that means the border or the edge. And so you can see that these structures are really kind of on the edge or the fringe of uh, that cerebral cortex. Now, our last structure uh, within the limbic system that we need to talk about is um, the amygdala. The amygdala is a Latin term for almond or tonsil, and it's because of its shape. It's shaped a little bit more like an almond shape, kind of fatter on one end and narrower on the other. And um, it is responsible for a lot of processing and memory of emotional reactions. So, for example, maybe the first time you wrecked your car, right? Notice how I said the first time, because <laughs> you're like any of us, you know, that's why we have car insurance, right? So the first time you wrecked your car, maybe you were living at mom and dad's, okay? And it was maybe in high school. And so that emotional response of either they were with you, which there was probably a lot of emotion in the car, or you had to explain to them what happened to the car, right? You're like, I, I hit the tennis ball. It's like right where it's supposed to be, right? Yeah, but the bumper's missing. Oh, yeah, I don't know. Okay, so that emotional response, you can remember that event. You can recall that event. Or maybe, um, you know, a, a great fond childhood memory of a fantastic birthday party, okay, where you got, you know, that toy that you were waiting for. Or maybe it was a poor memory or a bad memory of like a birthday party and nobody showed up. Okay? Or mom and dad forgot. You're like, oh my gosh, they don't even know I was born today. <laughs> I know, right? Aw, right? So there's an emotion that's tied to this. Um, the other thing is maybe um, there are certain things like family gatherings. In fact, one sense that's intimately tied to the limbic system is the sense of olfaction or smell. And for some strange reason, these neurons that innervate uh, in the olfactory bulb, they also send association neurons to the limbic system. So there may be a certain memory as a child that's a favorable memory or a bad memory, and a lot of times you can conjure up some sort of smell. 
associated with that. Okay, like Thanksgiving meal. And most of us, it reminds us of, you know, no school, okay? Uh, if you don't have lame professors, there's no exam when you get back, right? Um, no big assignments, you just kind of sit, maybe watch football and eat like there's no tomorrow, okay? <laughs> and you smell, you know, turkey cooking, or maybe you're not a, a, a meat person, okay? So it's like the pies that you like, okay? Um, or in some cases, you know, maybe family doesn't do well at Thanksgiving, and it's not a good memory, but those smells remind you of that, okay? Certain perfumes, certain colognes, um, you know, it's, it's no surprise that there are, there's this whole industry of essential oils and perfumes and colognes that are to conjure up certain emotions, like even emotions, uh, erotic emotions, like, ooh, that smells wonderful, right? <laughs> or, or, um... Emotions, of, I'm trying to figure out where that's coming from, and so you're going to kind of track towards it. Um, so the sense of smell is pretty intimately tied to uh, memory. And those are the two neuron sets that actually have the ability for mitotic division, is long-term memory cells as well as olfactory cells, okay, neurons. So this is the limbic system. You're, we're going to be pointing back to the limbic system a lot in this lecture and in the next lecture. Um, but right now, what I want to further uh, characterize are these cerebral hemispheres. <clears throat> and um, we've got basically two brains that we work with. So those of you that are kind of computer wired, uh, do you remember when the dual core processor came out? Right? It was like revolutionary. Some of you are like, I don't even know. It was like a sticker on the box. Didn't know what it meant. My friend said it was dope. Uh, but what it really means is you have, yeah, you, that was a little late in reaction, but I, I liked it. Um, there were two processors that worked in parallel. And they communicated to each other. And that's exactly what you have here, is you actually have two processing brains that have a communication port between the two, which is known as the corpus callosum. It's a white matter track that connects the two hemispheres. Well, as we get older, by the time you're in this classroom, you have already specialized into your right and your left side of your brain. Certain things that are going to be dominated by the left side of the brain and certain things are going to be dominated by the right side of the brain. Okay? And I'm not just talking about right-handed versus left-handed. Actually, motor coordination really has very little to do with that. All of us have regional areas of specialization in our left side and our right side that are very, very specific. So we talked about two last time. Which were they? Uh, on, on the left hemisphere, and one was found in the frontal lobe, and the other one was found in the parietal lobe. Broca's area, and the second one was? Wernicke's area, nicely done. And Broca's was mostly responsible for what? Motor speech, and Wernicke's was for speech understanding. Okay? And that's on the left side of the brain. Okay? So the left hemisphere, it shouldn't be a surprise, is for uh, activities such as language and reasoning. That's why Broca's and Wernicke's are found in the left hemisphere. Make sense? The right hemisphere is where activities like imagination and music and space pattern perception and artistic awareness, that is housed in the right side of the brain. So by the time you're an adult, you need both hemispheres to actually do all of the activities that you do well. In a lot of lower vertebrate species, there isn't this extensive of a cerebral specialization. So both the right and the left side kind of do the activities together. And those areas exist in both sides. They don't specialize quite as much. But as a homo sapien, having the ability to specialize <coughs> certain activities on the left side and certain activities on the right side gives us a greater ability to really master those activities. There was a hand up. What's, what decides if you're right or left-handed? So that's your motor cortex, and it's going to basically dominate you know, where those motor efferent pathways are most dominant. And it, it decides at, at, during development 
if it's going to be sort of motor function out of the left or motor function out of the right. Or in some individuals, it's both, and they're truly amb ambidextrous. And so they, you know, they play a lot of sports left-handed, and then they write with their right hand. Right? They, use, they use the pen with their right hand. Uh, it's, it's, not, it's not uncommon for folks uh, to have that sort of capability. And it's more likely that left-handers are more ambidextrous than right-handers. Okay? So the right and the left hemisphere is connected by this, this corpus callosum, and we've got this hemispheric dominance in all of us. And what I mean by that is all of us have sort of a uh, left hemispheric or a right hemispheric bend or slant. It's part of our personality, if you will. So for example, it's not that your other hemisphere doesn't work. It's just that your dominant forecast that you're going to actually broadcast is going to be either a right or a left hemispheric dominance. Okay? And, and some individuals are less sort of tipped, and, and they, they truly operate out of both hemispheres, and they're, they're considered to be you know, uh, very skilled in multiple areas. So for example, all of us have all of these, but some of us recognize that Okay, if I primarily am more logical in nature, if I'm a little bit more detail-oriented, uh, if I really get excited about facts, uh, math and science, okay, everything that's more reality-based, I like safe decisions, okay, I'm not, I don't really like to gamble, it's not really my thing, you know what I mean, let's just play for fun, Vegas, right? But so that's that means that your 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 hemisphere that's actually mostly dominant in your activities and your decision making is your left brain. Others, right, fall into this category. And because they fall into this category, they don't really like categories. Well, we would list them. Just kidding. But they're more feeling oriented. They use big pictures. Right? They, they want to see the big picture. Don't, don't get bottled down with the, with, with the details. Right? They're, um, you know, they might have a bend in philosophy and religion. Uh, they like to take risks. It's fun. Right? That's the answer. They, Why did you do that? Well, it's fun. You know, oh, well, we lost all our money. Big deal, you know. <laughs> um, likes to work with people. People, people. Right? I'm a people, people. Right? Versus I like to work alone. So it's not, you know, so what I don't want you to think is, you know, if you dominate math and science, then you cannot have a religion. I mean, that, that's not true. We all have all these categories, but there are certain individuals that are more dominated by left hemispheric domination and others that are dominated by right hemispheric. Okay? And you can think about this probably in your own family. Like, I have four kids, and I can put my four kids into either of these two columns. Right? Same gene pool, but they're dramatically different. Right? So you might be thinking about your sibling right, that you have uh, and think, oh wow, you know, I am definitely in this side of the uh, living my life dominated by my right hemisphere and my sister or my brother is over on this side. So is there any like, cadence for whether it's the nature or your kind of uh, pattern? Really? No, there isn't really, um, there isn't really much data that's uh, Definitive on, you know, if you take somebody and you put them into an environment that's more uh, left hemispheric dominance, uh, is that the way they turn out? Well, there's probably going to be some influence there, but, you know, they, they might, you know, be the individual that um, is, you know, in an environment that's uh, uh, right hemispheric uh, dominated, right? Um, and then all of a sudden they decide that they're going to uh, uh, pick up. Um, a, a foreign language, and it comes super easy. I mean, it just they never knew it because it was never really propagated within that environment. So, a lot of this is pre-programmed. So, another thing to answer that question is when we're younger. And here, this is actually an interesting uh, story about language. So, when we're younger, how many of you speak a, a second language or a second tongue? How many of you would say that you do it well? And you have a, you don't have really an accent in English or in your second language, or maybe English is your second language and your first tongue is Spanish or French or German or Swahili or whatever. <laughs> so of those that raise their hand, let me see them again. You speak a second language and you're pretty fluent. You know, we can come up here and do some quizzing in a second. Okay. 
Uh, when did you learn your second language? Keep your hand up if you learned it prior to the age of 10. Prior to the age of 10. Keep it if you learned it prior to the age of 12. Prior to the age of 15. Okay, so 18. So you just learned it this week, and you're fluent with no accent. That's impressive. Okay. So if you were watching what happened, most of the hands that, that were, were uh, remaining up were younger. Okay. So what happens when we're developing our brain is an infant, a child, uh, under the age of three, is using both hemispheres to do all activities. It's super inefficient. So just take uh, an example of writing, okay? And if you take a three-year-old, you have them write anything with their right hand, and then with their left hand, it looks basically the same. You with me? And then by the age of five, their right versus their left hand, they're writing their name now at the age of five, and you can really start to see some differences by the age of five, right? And then if you go to the age of 10, Writing with the right versus the left hand gets dramatically different. Now, at, at your age, right, if you haven't practiced, it would be uh, like a little kid was writing your name versus with your dominant hand, it looks quote-unquote normal. So in those milestones, 3, 5, 10, and then the next one's 12, and then 15, and then after 15, it's all pretty much the same, the... Amount of activity that is being used by both hemispheres is shared when you're young. And as you age, you start splitting off and you start compartmentalizing the right versus the left side of the brain. So the language example. If you learn a second language at a very young age, it's most likely that you will not have an accent in either of those tongues. Because your brain has learned it and then compartmentalized the language later in life. But right now, as an adult, if you were to learn a second language, it's much more likely, A, it's going to be more difficult, B, it's going to be more likely that you're going to remain with an accent of your native tongue uh, than, uh, than the, uh, the next individual. Okay? And these, are, these are generalizations, but if you interact with people, my mother speaks four languages, okay? and um, three of them were learned prior to the age of uh, 10. And then English was the last one. So her accent in English is definitely uh, more obvious than it is in any of the other tongues. Right? Uh, so if you look at people that speak multiple languages, you, you can kind of see these patterns based upon how the brain uh, separates. So here's the last question, and then we'll move back to this. If you were going to have uh, brain damage or a stroke, would it be um, preferred to have it when you're young, or to prefer to have it when you're older? Okay, think about it. So the other piece of this that you need to understand is, obviously, um, maturation of the brain between 3, 5, 10, and 12, and then beyond, there's an obvious maturation, right? The cognitive capabilities of a 3-year-old are very different than an 18-year-old, typically, right? <laughs> Hopefully, right, exactly. So, after you know that, what's the answer? Young or old, where would you rather have your brain down? You're like, oh man, I don't know, this is a trick question. It is a trick question. And it depends on what type of damage. Okay, fine. So, if, if you have your brain damage when you're younger, and it's to uh, the frontal cortex, right, the hemispheres, um, then that brain damage uh, is going to prevent cognitive development. And so there will be mental retardation, meaning a lack of mental development, and you won't ever behave with adult-like cognitive capabilities. Right? If you have your brain damage when you're older, like when you're in your 70s with a stroke, it does depend on what areas uh, influence, but oftentimes... The, you can think like an adult, but there may be certain functions in certain parts of the brain that are completely gone. Speech is affected. Um, memory is affected. Um, motor function is affected. 
but you are still cerebrally able to act like an adult, make adult-like decisions. So it, there is no right answer. It's just a, a, a challenging question to make you think about brain development. And, I mean, it's important the entire process, but what happens when you're very young <coughs> sets the stage for what happens when you're very old. Okay. So just another picture on um, cerebral lateralization or specialization. Um, <clears throat> You can kind of see some of the different uh, centers. Uh, this is the posterior aspect, this is the anterior aspect. So this is the left hemisphere, this is the right hemisphere. On the left hemisphere, we have um, speech, right? We have uh, language comprehension. So this would be Wernicke's, this would be Broca's. Um, on the left side, we have right hand motor control. On the right hemisphere, we have left hand motor control. So the question that took place of what determines uh, whether you're right or left-handed, well, it's programmed genetically, but if you're left-handed, then your motor control is dominated out of your right hemisphere or your hands and fine motor uh, dexterity, okay? Your, your left leg is probably your dominant leg, okay? That's the leg you'd want to do kicking activities with, like... Uh, you know, kicking the shin of your favorite professor, right? Um, left hand, left foot dominant. Also may determine whether or not you ride goofy or regular on a skateboard or a snowboard, okay, or on a wakeboard. Um, you can kind of see how this plays out. So again, it's not that the left hand motor control individual, because it's dominant on this side, doesn't have any of these activities, right? Um, they, they absolutely do. It's just that this portion of the precentral gyrus is the dominant motor function in that individual. Now, what's interesting is um, in, in left-handed individuals, the left frontal, the left parietal, and the temporal and occipital lobe are slightly wider. So my wife's left-handed. She likes that. She, so that means that lefties have bigger brains, is what you're saying. So, okay, fine. Yes. Um, the, um, oh man, what's going on? There it is. My mouth is all wonky. Now, the um, studies that happen done, because someone was actually asking, is if you're right handed, if you're right handed, does that mean that you're left hemisphere dominant all the time? No, of course not. In fact, one of the studies that was done um, amongst right handers. 96% uh, of them have left brain dominance in this particular study that was done. It was college-age individuals in science classes. Okay, but that doesn't mean that 100%. In the same study, 70% um, of the, oh, hang on, left-handers, 15% uh, of the left-handers in the same study had right brain dominance. And the rest of them had left brain dominance. Now, what's wrong with the study right from the beginning? It's science classes, okay? But you can understand that even within a segment of science classes, if you survey right-handers and left-handers, it's not that one side of the brain goes with left-handers and one side of the brain goes with right-handers, okay? So we don't really have any definitive conclusions based on these studies. It's just an interesting fact to be able to pull out there. I've got three righties and one lefty. And my wife is left-handed, and I'm right-handed, right? So you could do the Putnam Square on that, but it came out pretty much accurate. It's pretty interesting. Okay. All right, so the corpus callosum. Yes, we gamble with genetics in my family all the time. All right, so corpus callosum. This is this white matter tract that connects the two hemispheres. If we finish out on the forebrain, additional structures of the forebrain, um, we're going to see these structures that we're going to talk about next. We've got uh, the forebrain, to remind you, it's the telencephalon, which is also known as the cerebrum, uh, plus the diencephalon. And then the diencephalon is made up of the thalamus, the hypothalamus, the pituitary, and the pineal gland. So in order, our thalamus. Thalamus acts as um, a relay center. Much of the neuronal input that comes into the brain actually is going to go through the thalamus on its way to the cerebral cortex. So all of the sensory information that comes from the posterior aspect comes into the thalamus 
that surrounds and sits uh, circumferencing the third ventricle. <coughs> and the information from the thalamus then is going to go up to, uh, or down to rather, the hypothalamus, right? The hypothalamus is what sits below uh, the, the thalamus. Hypo meaning under, right? So in the hypothalamus, we have these centers. We have centers for thirst, water balance, pleasure, rage, sexual desire, hunger, sleep patterns, temperature, and aggression. So the hypothalamus is some of our innate human behaviors. Things that are actually really critical to survival as an organism. All of these would be absolutely necessary for survival. Okay? You know, you have to eat and you have to maintain water. You need to reproduce in order to propagate your genes. Um, you need to rest. You need to homeostatic regulate the entire organism. And if provoked, you need to be able to respond. Right? So all the hypothalamus is kind of like your raw human instinct, is what a lot of texts will describe it as. Now, other structures in this region. We've got our pituitary gland, and we have the pineal gland. The pineal gland is shown here in green, and the pituitary gland hangs down below the hypothalamus. This little uh, structure right here. Now, as you move on into 202, you're going to look at the endocrine function uh, uh, of these organ or these structures, these organs. And what you're going to see is the pituitary gland exists as a front and a back, or an anterior pituitary and a posterior pituitary. And the anterior pituitary is where many of your hormones are released from. Hormones that actually control uh, much of your daily activity, including growing patterns. Uh, and all of this anterior pituitary is influenced by the hypothalamus that sat right above it. Hypothalamus is right here. You send a signal from the hypothalamus to the pituitary gland, right here, and you release things that regulate growth, blood pressure, sexual organ development, Right? When, when, when adolescence or puberty actually hits, uh, there's a super funny uh, segment in that movie. I have a, I, my, my, my oldest daughter just turned 13 uh, on Friday. And um, uh, so we have a teenager in the house now, right? And there's this button, like this is the, com the command center. You guys remember this? There's this command center, right? And after the end of the movie, this new button shows up. And the new button says... Puberty. That's how they pronounce it. Puberty. And, and, and some of the emotions go, what's that? Puberty. I don't know. Push it! Or something like that, right? And then I think the movie ended. So, the pituitary gland is going to control, essentially, the puberty button. Okay? And uh, regulates things even like uh, what happens during pregnancy. And then last, like someone's like, I need to watch this movie. You really do. Um, I should put a question from the movie on the next yeah. exam. Huh? Yeah. Okay, all right. Is that, is that fair? Yeah, she credit. Yeah, she credit. Someone said extra credit. Well, I'll, I'll think about it. That would be kind of fun. Yeah. All right, so the pineal gland. The pineal gland. Make sure you pronounce that right. The author. The pineal gland. Melatonin is what I wanted to make sure you pronounce correctly. Right? Melatonin. Because it's not melanin or melanin. What was melanin and melanin? It's in the skin. It's the pigment of the skin, right? That's absolutely right. They're manufactured by melanocytes. Uh, here, this is melatonin. Melatonin actually is released um, during darkness, during your dark cycle. And it's what causes drowsiness or for you to want to go to sleep. How many of you work late nights or a graveyard shift. Okay. So those of us that work late nights or graveyard shifts, your melatonin levels are a little off. And so what a lot of folks will do is they'll supplement with over-the-counter melatonin during the day cycle in order to try to make themselves be able to fall asleep. Okay. But light actually blocks the release of melatonin. So you stop making it when you see the sunlight. 
right? So this is responsible for our circadian rhythms. Circadian rhythms is a terminology that comes from a lot of lower species of animals where their light-dark cycles are tied to either uh, daytime or nocturnal activities based upon melatonin release, okay? And so this is actually the pineal gland up here that's responsible for deciding when you feel like you need to go to sleep. In fact, in some reptiles, which is interesting, this pineal gland sits very superficial in the brain, and there is a little clear translucent window in their skull that allows for the sunlight to directly stimulate the pineal gland. Okay? So we don't have that, in case you're curious. Don't shave your head to find it. It's not there. Okay. Hindbrain and midbrain. We're almost done with this segment um, as we wrap up uh, the back of the brain. The cerebellum, the medulla oblongata, and the pons. So here's our cerebellum, here's our pons, and here is our medulla oblongata. So structures of the hindbrain. Hindbrain is the metencephalon plus the myelencephalon. The metencephalon is our pons and our cerebellum, and the myencephalon is the medulla oblongata. So we're going to go in order of these three structures. The cerebellum, affectionately referred to as the little brain, it functions, its main function is for muscle coordination. So a stroke in the cerebellum may actually manifest itself clinically in a patient where they have a lack of muscle coordination in certain activities. Now, the other place where muscle coordination could be compromised if there was a stroke, where's another place in the brain where if there was a stroke, and if it wasn't the cerebellum that you're looking at, you'd be looking at something else. What is that? What's that? The primary motor cortex of what? The frontal lobe, uh, uh, frontal lobe right? Uh, the uh, cerebrum. Okay, very good. So you can imagine a test question, for example, that could be a great A and B only with those two options as answers. Are you with me? Okay. It also um, helps to maintain posture uh, because that's muscle coordination. There's a tremendous amount of muscle coordination keeping us able to stand up straight or sit up straight, right? Actually, uh, I just had this conversation this afternoon about uh, posture with a student, and we were talking about how our posture these days is so negatively influenced, and we're getting so many more people in their middle ages that are having more back problems because of our posture, and the lack of focus on, you know, like core strengthening activities, uh, and, you know, sitting, sitting all day long with the computer kind of doing this number, right? Driving like this while you're texting, you know, you're kind of doing one of these, right? So all of the stuff that we're doing all day long is kind of pulling us forward, and we don't take time to kind of think about how we're sitting or standing. Well, the brain structure that's responsible for postural muscles is uh, the cerebellum. Uh, within the cerebellum, if you remember back to lab, when you uh, cut through this section, uh, or this uh, organ, you cut through it and you saw this section, you're able to appreciate uh, the arborizations, or what we call the arbor vitae, which is the tree of life, is actually how it translates. Arbor, tree, and vitae, life. So tree life is how it translates. Well, this tree of life uh, is the white matter architecture within the cerebellum. So the cerebellum has white and gray matter, just like what we see in the cerebrum. But it has very unique characteristics that are associated with it. The ridges here are actually called folia rather than gyri. Um, in the medulla, we're down towards the brainstem, and so I want to remind you sort of a review question in preparation for next Tuesday. The brain is organized in three main axes. Give me all three of them. <coughs> What's that? Sagittal, coronal, so you're thinking about planes of section. So you're, 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 you're correct on planes of section, but I want to talk about organization of the brain and its function. Today we opened up talking about right versus left, so I'll give you one. It's organized right to left. Certain things are focused on in the right hemisphere, certain things are uh, focused on in the left hemisphere. Give me the other two. 
front to back. So tell me what happens in the posterior aspect, which would be the sensory input towards the back or the posterior aspect. And as you move forward, it's high thinking, it's high thinking and motor activity, like what you're going to do with it. You, you, you see something, you hear somebody honk, and you see them tell you they're no, you're number one, right? Waving in the window, <laughs> right? And so now emotions come up, like, oh, they really think I'm number one. How yeah. lovely. And the emotions come forward, and you process, and you make a decision to wave back, right? Maybe you tell them they're number one or two. I don't know what you do. But you process this information, you make a decision, right? One of my favorite ones are the people that just do this. Right? And they just, like, just hold the horn down, and you're like, really? <laughs> But you make a decision. So that was a thought process to lay down the horn and just let it sit there. Okay? There's, there's con so that's one. Back to front. Ro rostral and caudal. Okay? What's, which one's which? <laughs> rostral is what? Is basically the top or the head. Caudal means, Latin means tail. Okay? The cauda equina. You guys remember this? What's the cauda equina? It's the, it's the end. It's the termination of the spinal cord. It's, cauda equina means uh, tail of the horse, right? Equina is horse. Cauda is tail. So that's the Latin of uh, tail of the horse. Is, is where the spinal cord terminates with those fibers that kind of look like a horse's tail. So what? Okay. So top to bottom. So why did this slide remind me? Up top to bottom. The medulla oblongata is where? It's down more inferior, right? It's more caudal, or it's more caudally uh, located. So what are the functionalities that you would expect from a structure that's more caudally located? Innate functions. Auto automatic, autonomic functions. So let's look at the list. Things like uh, rhythm of the heart and breathing that you don't have to think about at a conscious level. Reflexes for coughing, sneezing, gagging, swallowing, vomiting, salivation, and sweating. These are things that you don't have to think about for them to happen. They happen all by themselves, otherwise known as autonomically or automatically. Okay, so this is located at the level of the brainstem, and it, making the decision to, to cut the person off in traffic after they told you you were number one, that's higher, believe it or not, that is higher brain function up here than even things like controlling heart rate. Okay? So this is our third axis that I really want you guys to, to think about. Okay, along those lines of, um, wait, I think there might have been something. Uh, so it's not on this list, but I want to explain this to you. Um, so in the old capital punishment medieval method of death by hanging, right? The strategy was very scientific. The strategy was to place the noose or the rope at about C2 so that uh, the axis vertebrae would fracture when the individual's weight fell and it would come in and sever the medulla oblongata. And, that's, and then the heart rate and breathing would stop immediately. Okay? Yes, you poop your pants, in case you're curious. Okay? Um, and this is still uh, the target location for sniper fire. So if you're going to take it, when snipers are trained for a death shot at a distance, uh, they're shooting at the base of the skull to try to actually pierce the medulla oblongata. Not on the slide, but you can write it in that little white space. Uh, hello? Am I still on? Yeah. Okay, that was weird. All right, upon. So are we higher or low function? Higher or low function? Overall. We're low function. Okay, we're low on the tree or the axis. So you're going to get things that are maybe more automatic uh, versus cognitive thought processes. You're not going to be doing mathematics within the ponds. You're going to be doing things like um, associating sleep, um, hearing, equilibrium, taste, eye movements, facial expressions, right? Many of our facial expressions are almost just reflexes. 
right? Aren't they? Yeah, I think they are to my children, I'm pretty sure. Okay, I can say a couple of key words and I can get like, okay? <laughs> Breathing, swallowing, and bladder control is at the level of the pond. So an infarct in the ponds, uh, the person might be incontinent now. An infarct, a stroke. An infarct is a, a, a damage to the ponds uh, after a stroke event, an infarct in the area of the pons may lead to a loss of, of uh, control of the bladder function, incontinence. Okay, as we wrap it up, the midbrain. So the midbrain, uh, otherwise known as the mesencephalon, we've got four strategic uh, hemispheric processes. And we call these the corpora quadrigemina, quad because there's four. And they're kind of colored in yellow on that right slide over here, or that right image, right here. And we have two pairs known as the superior colliculi, and we have two pairs known as the inferior colliculi. So this is the region that we're talking about. Okay? And so in the level of the brain, let's back up to a picture like this. If we're kind of in this region right here, are we at higher processing intellectually, or are we still more more automatic type of things at the level of the beginning of the brain stem. We're still talking about more automatic processes, right? So again, these are more reflexes. And the hills is what the colliculi stands for, or translates to. So we have two that are up top known as superior, two that are down low known as inferior. And so in the sheep brain dissection, if you got to the brain stem, you actually probably could have seen these if you peel, if you kind of fold it back, if you fold the lab manual, you kind of uh, reflect back the brainstem, they kind of look like two sets of peas staring at you. Okay, they're about the size of a pea, uh, each of them. So two little pea pods up here and two little pea pods down here. And the top ones, the superior colliculi, these allow for the tracking of moving objects. Right? So if you're you know, downtown and a friend goes by on a, on a bicycle and you recognize them and you're able to follow them, that's your superior colliculi that are allowing your eyes to track as the individual is moving and capture information, sending it to the cerebral cortex so you can identify, hey, there goes Matthew, right? How come he's naked? No, <laughs> Maybe that's Saturday night, I don't know Matthew, but. All right, the inferior colliculi. This allows for auditory reflexes. Auditory reflexes, which would be if you heard a sound, if you're walking downtown and you hear a siren, you know, essentially, it, it, within a moment, you can figure out the siren's coming from over that way. Right? Or the siren sounds like it's coming right at me. Or it sounds like it's going away from me. So the structure that's responsible for auditory tracking is the inferior colliculi. Right? Okay? And then, <clears throat> lastly, in this lecture, and then we're going to go ahead and start the next lecture, but we won't go that far. We'll finish it up on Thursday. Is the structure known as the reticular formation. The reticular formation is this network of gray matter. And it spreads vertically throughout the brain. And you can kind of appreciate these blue arrows that are sort of indicating how it radiates out from the thalamus. So this is a way at which the thalamus is going to send signals to the different respective parts of the brain as information comes in. It'll become a little bit more apparent as we start studying uh, the rest of the central nervous system, and that's the spinal cord. Because we talk about reflexes as, as, as information comes in. Information, for example, about walking. So as I walk across the front of the lecture hall, I'm getting sensory information that's telling me uh, where my feet are in space. I'm getting information that's telling me how fast they're moving. I'm getting information that tells me I should probably stop because there's a wall coming. All of that's going up to the thalamus, and the thalamus is sending signals via the reticular formation to all the different parts of the brain, including the eyes, right? Including uh, occipital lobes, including uh, areas for auditory reflexes. Because if I heard someone say, oh, oh what, right? Or ow, I know I stepped on their foot, so I moved my foot out of the way. All of this feedback information is happening real time to you and me throughout the day as we run to class, as we walk to class, right? As we uh, navigate throughout our day. So we crawl to class, okay? <laughs> that might be next Tuesday. 
So this helps with the coordination of somatic motor. Somatic means body, cell, motor activity. <clears throat> Cardiovascular activity. Blood pressure, heart rate. Pain. Consciousness. Sleep. And habituation, or our habit patterns. The way you walk is unique to you. Right? Have you ever seen the silhouette of a friend coming down the sidewalk? You're like, oh, I know that's, I know that's Sally. I can see her strutting or whatever Sally does. Like, her walk is so her, right? Uh, I can tell my four kids without even seeing their faces. You know, they're coming down from walking the dog out of the forest. I can tell who has them, kind of based on their size, but also based upon how they're walking. Okay? So this is all part of our reticular formation. Questions over this lecture? <laughs>